This is the new iPhone 15 Pro Max. It's got a new titanium build, a USB-C port, a 5x telephoto lens, and some other interesting changes. Let's unbox this, test out the new features, and I'll also show you the first 10 things I would do to take maximum advantage of this phone with iOS 17 and get it looking something like this. Here's the new iPhone. It comes in the usual box with the two peels. Here it is, the iPhone sits right on top, and it really does feel a lot lighter. And of course, one more satisfying peel. I love this color. Aside from from that, there's a new USB-C cable, it's braided and it feels pretty nice. And then there's just the paperwork and an Apple sticker. Overall, it's a very simple but nice unboxing experience. Okay, so this is my first time holding the iPhone 15 Pro Max, and it might look similar to last gen, but this is definitely my favorite iPhone design to date. The 14 Pro Max was almost shockingly heavy, with a glossy stainless steel rim that tracked a lot of fingerprints. Now for the 15 Pro Max, they replaced it with this brush texture titanium frame, and it feels really great. It's also slightly more resistant to fingerprints, at least this blue color. The titanium also makes the new phone 8% lighter, which doesn't sound like much, but it's very noticeable. And I do think it significantly improves the experience of holding and using this phone. The last small complaint that I had about last gen was just how sharp the edges were, but now they've introduced a rounder curve. The difference is small though, so it won't matter if you use a case, but it's a nice refinement nonetheless. Another kind of surprising thing is that the 15 Pro Max is actually slightly smaller than last the screen size is exactly the same at 6.7 inches, but the screen bezels are noticeably thinner. I think it looks great, and it's still about the same thickness as last gen, but there actually is a slightly bigger battery. It's now 4,422 milliamp hours, and with the new A17 Pro chip, which is made with the new 3 nanometer process, it could last quite a bit longer, but I will test this out more in the full review. And this new chip is indeed insanely fast, especially the new GPU is around 20% faster. The single core performance is also significantly improved at around 11% faster than the A16 chip. And the multi-core performance sees a more modest 7% improvement. Now, this is definitely the fastest mobile CPU right now, but even with the last gen device, I never really felt the phone slow down due to intense CPU task. The only time that I could benefit from being faster is during gaming. And speaking of gaming, the GPU performance is significant, but actually not that revolutionary. It's only roughly on par with the Snapdragon 8 Gen 2, which is almost one year old now. The A17 Pro chip should still be more than enough for most games, but being a new 3 nanometer architecture, I kind of expected a little bit more. Other than that, the back is still the same matte glass, and I think it feels really good. I got the blue titanium color, and in person, it actually looks really good. The blue color really pops out when it catches the light. The front screen is the same as before, with the same ceramic shield, 120Hz, and 2000 nits peak brightness. So it's still one of the brightest screens out there, and it's comfortably visible even in bright sunlight. The dynamic island is still here as well. Last year, when it first came out, not many apps supported it, but now it has actually become pretty useful, such as the Uber Live activity. Being able to always see the estimated time in the island is really helpful. And now that Apple has brought it to the non-pro iPhone 15s, there's even more reason for apps to make use of it now. So hopefully it'll become even more useful, and it's probably going to be here for a long time to come. Besides the overall shape, there are some other pretty major changes too, such as the action button and the USB-C port. So finally, the iPhone can be charged with the same cable as everything else. But unfortunately, it still doesn't charge any faster than before. Being able to fast charge can sometimes be helpful, but I actually charge with MagSafe most of the time, which also isn't any faster. And now with the new standby mode, there's more reason than ever to use one of these MagSafe stands. Also, the USB-C port can now deliver power to other devices. It's pretty slow though, at just 4.5 watts. So really, it's only useful for charging up accessories like AirPods. It's a pretty cool feature, but honestly, reverse wireless charging would have been much cooler. Another perk of the USB-C port is the transfer speed, but only on the Pro phones. Given how big the ProRes video and RAW photos can be, we really should have gotten this last year. But at least now there's a way to transfer things at USB 3.0 speed, which is 20 times faster than Lightning. However, just know that the cable that comes with the phone will only give you USB 2.0 speed. And now there's more reason than ever to shoot these larger files with the introduction of log video shooting mode. But the camera app can only shoot in ProRes HQ, which makes the files huge. At least 
case, you can directly shoot it into an external SSD. And we'll see if these huge video files are actually worth it in my upcoming full review. Also, recently I started using the Blackmagic camera app, which has completely changed how I take videos, especially on this new iPhone. It just gives you all the controls that you need, and it also lets you shoot Apple log video in the more compressed ProRes LT codec. This app also supports a monitor LUT, so log doesn't look as gray when you're shooting it, which I think makes it much easier to use. And as for the cameras, so only the Pro Max got the new 5x telephoto lens, and that's quite a bit more reach. But now, there's kind of a gap in coverage. The 3x and 4x look noticeably worse. I do really like the 5x 120mm perspective for portrait shots. And now, you don't even have to decide between a regular photo or portrait, because it saves all the depth information, so you can always add the portrait effect later in post, and even change the focus area. This is really cool. The ultra-wide looks about the same quality, and same with the selfie camera, which is a shame, because even last year, I felt that it was noticeably behind its Samsung competition. And the main lens is 48 megapixels just like last year, but now you can have a 24 megapixel image by default, and it does look better than last gen's 12 megapixel image, while only being about 1.5 times bigger. This is much better than a pro raw file, which can be 30 times bigger. But actually now in iOS 17, there's a way to shoot 48 megapixel non-raw photos. Just go into the settings and then camera and then formats. It's currently set to pro raw max, but just change it to the HEIF max. I feel like if you're not doing much post-processing, then the extra information of the raw isn't really that useful. However, the HEIF still gives you all the resolution benefits while being 15 times smaller than the pro raw max. This is a really nice new setting and I'm glad it's also available on the 14 pros. But just know that when using the HEIF max, you still won't have live photos. And since the 15 pro max's main sensor is 48 megapixels, you can actually crop in up to 1.5 times and still get a 24 megapixel image. The 1.5 times crop only looks slightly worse than just 1x. And perhaps to take advantage of this, they now give you the option to set either 1.2 or 1.5 times as a default for the main camera if you like those perspectives more. Another new setting is the level. If you toggle it on, then you'll have this line that tells you if the shot is level with the horizon. I find this very useful, so the camera settings can definitely be something worth customizing. And speaking of which, here are the next nine things I would do to get the most out of this phone. Check this out. I can press the action button to make my screen dimmer, which is very helpful at night when the minimum brightness still feels a little bit too bright. I got this by mapping the button to accessibility and then reduce white point. But this action button is now basically a hotkey to do anything you want instead of just being a mute switch. There are lots of options, including turning on the camera, a specific focus mode, and it can also run any shortcut. So lots of possibilities there. Also, there's now this small icon right next to the time that indicates silent mode being on. So you can still very quickly tell whether you're on ring or silent. Now, if you want more than one shortcut, you can still use the back tap feature that's always been there. It's found under the accessibility settings, and just like the action button, you can map things for the double and triple tapping. It has a lot of the same shortcuts as the action button, like turning on the camera, the flashlight, or even running a specific shortcut. I find that they respond very well even with a case on, although it's not 100% reliable, unlike the new action button. And specifically, if you want a shortcut for opening up an app, it might be easier to just add it as a lock screen widget. The app Widgie can do this, and right now I have this YouTube icon that directly takes me to the app. It's very fast and there are no redirects. And how you set it is in Widgie, you go to the Explore tab and then go under Lock. Find the app launcher that you want and then import it. Then go to Manage and add the import widget there. And that's it. Now you can add it to your lock screen. And other great widgets to add to the lock screen are the first party weather and battery ones. They give great info just at a glance and everything is still very readable even on the AOD. Interactive widgets are also super useful. It's one of my favorite features on Android. And now finally, it's on iPhone as well. Here's a Reminders widget and I can check things off right on my home screen. The Apple Music widget now also lets you pause music directly, but actually not just the home screen. Lock screen widgets can now be interactive as well, so I can actually check things off my list right from there. It's so convenient. However, right now, most third-party widgets aren't interactive. I'm really looking forward to the Spotify one. And other than the interactive ones, I have this aesthetic date and battery widget in a stack along with my to-do list, so that whenever I don't feel like seeing my list anymore, I can very quickly hide it. And the cool thing is that this widget 
budget can match with my background wallpaper so that it basically looks transparent. It's from Widgie and how you set it up is go to manage and then click on set up transparency and add in a screenshot of the home screen with no other widgets or apps. We have to do all of this because Apple actually doesn't support transparent widgets. But honestly, why not? I love how clean transparent widgets look and I'll have this one linked down below. In general, Widgie has a lot of widget options for the home and lock screen and you can even make your own, although there is a little bit of a learning curve, but it can be worth it to get really personalized widgets. And over here, I have a calendar and Apple Music widget also in this aesthetic and functional widget stack. Widget Smith is another one of my favorite widget apps. Here, you can make home and lock screen widgets as well. And there are all kinds of options like time, sun path, and calendar, which is what I use. The color and the fonts can also be customized. And I also found this app called Overdrop that has lots of super clean looking weather widgets, and I've added one as well. But now widgets can actually be even more useful in the new standby mode, especially the interactive ones. I can check things off and control my music without going into my phone at all. You can add any two home screen widgets in this new mode, which activates whenever you have the phone horizontal while charging, like here on this MagSafe stand, which is why I think this is the best way to use this feature. Not just widgets though, standby mode can show a bunch of photos as well, and there are also several cute clock styles that can be further customized. And I noticed that if you have a live activity going on, you can actually click on that to pull it up as this really big full screen widget. And here's something that almost never happens. Apple bringing back a remove feature. The live wallpaper is back from the dead. Now, when you set a live photo as a wallpaper, it can automatically play in slow motion every time you wake the phone. My dog looks hilarious in this. Of course, you can further customize the font and color of the time. You can also have more than one lock screen. And here are some new wallpapers in iOS 17 that you might not have noticed. Every planet in the solar system is now here, and I've replaced the Earth that I've always used. A bonus is that the swipe animation between each planet looks super cool, and there is the entire solar system at the end. Remember last year when they introduced the PNG cutouts? I thought they looked like stickers and now they really doubled down on it. You can make the cutout into a sticker and then you can access it in the emoji keyboard. But not just that, you can give it effects like this sparkly one and there's even this shifting effect to mimic interacting with the lights. I find these super fun, especially in iMessage where they can be stuck anywhere just like a real sticker. If you've ever tried to airdrop in a more crowded space, you'll know it can be a pain trying to find the right person with with so many other airdrops being on. But now in iOS 17, you can just hold two phones together and it'll airdrop. Also, this isn't just for the new phones. Any phone with iOS 17 can do this and the animation looks really cool. And not only can you customize your own phone, now you can customize how you show up for other people whenever you call them. In the contacts app, you can customize your contact poster with a background photo and also play with the fonts. If there's a subject, then you can try putting it in front of the text to get this pretty cool looking depth effect, just like how you can on the lock screen. So yeah, that's everything. iOS 17 gives lots of nice new features and most of the customizations I just mentioned can be on any iPhone with a new update. The new 15 Pro Max's hardware is pretty cool too and I'll be switching over to use it as my daily driver and do more tests on the camera, battery life, and performance for my full review. So make sure you subscribe for that. If you've enjoyed this video, you can check out more of my content on Instagram and TikTok, and you can also watch more here.